Hello, everybody. Welcome to Red Toolhouse. Today, we are not at Red Toolhouse. Kelly and I are up at our camp in the mountains for a project we want to get done before cold weather starts uh, showing up. So come along. Let me show you what we've got going on. So the plan on this brief trip is to get our stone surround, or kind of our heat shield around our little wood-burning stove here in place before cold weather hits, and we actually have to burn a fire to stay warm at night. So right now it's just going to be down in the low 50s, high 40s, so we can manage that without a fire. But I uh, want to be able to get stone in place, let it cure, so when we come up here the next time, it'll be time for a fire, and it'll, everything will be in good shape. Now what we're going to do, we've collected, we went down to the river, because we're just up the mountain from the river, we went down to the river and collected some river stone. And that's what we want to do. We want to utilize free material, and obviously the sentimental value of the material coming from the river that we enjoy spending so much time in. So we got a couple pieces here just to make sure that was going to work, but we got to go collect a lot of stone. So Kelly's going to help me do that. The problem we're running into is we've been dealing with an extreme drought here in West Virginia for the past three months. The river has been almost completely dried up, so that's why we wanted to come up here. Well, the last 24 hours, that drought has been um, offset a bit by a, a, a large amount of rain that's fallen in this part of the state. So the river is actually rolling pretty good right now. So I thought I was going to be able to walk dryly in my shoes here and stuff just across the riverbed picking up stones. But I think I'm going to have to switch to some wet gear and uh, see if we can harvest stones that way. So come along. Let's head to the river. All right. So we're going to head down to the river real quick. And Kelly's driving. Say hi, Kel. Yeah, it never fails. And yeah, I gotta. I, I think some of you guys always want a proof of life. Make sure Kelly's still around. But she's uh, obviously got all kinds of things going on as well. Busy on the homestead, um, so she's not on as many videos. But I think you know, I'm watching our friends Chuck and Sandra, where uh, Sandra's more in the video and, and trying to get Kelly more involved in that. But Chuck always refers to her as Whistle Britches. Do we need to come up with a nickname for you? No. <laughs> well, I was thinking if she was Whistle Britches, no. how about Thunderpants? <laughs> okay, maybe not. We'll uh, we'll punt on that effort. All right, to the river. Well, colors are starting to come on. <clears throat> well, this is going to be interesting. Be the equivalent of coming down here and doing this tonight. Holy moly, that's cold. I can't see a daggone thing. Timber, can you see anything? We have to go seek another spot. Dog. So I want to give a shout out to this week's video sponsor, and that's AvaPow. They sent me this 6,000 amp 12 volt jump starter and power pack. And my goodness, this is one of those things you need to have in all of your vehicles. Gone are the days of keeping jumper cables under the back seat. Now you keep these type of kits. And if you've got a dead battery or you run into somebody who's got a dead battery and you need to give them a jump, these things really work well. I like this kit specifically because it is 6,000 amps, so this thing packs a punch. It can easily start this Toyota. It could start my diesel tractor side by side all day long, all of those type of things. In fact, they show it jump starting all the way up to a 12 liter diesel. This one's not only a jump starter pack, but it also has USB outputs so you can charge your phone has a 12 volt DC output, like a cigarette lighter, which I know in older vehicles, you can actually jumpstart a car that way if for some reason you couldn't connect to the battery terminals. It also has an LED light for safety and security purposes. So if you're on the side of the road, you've got that, but it also has multiple function flash. That's an SOS. And then of course, just another flashing for safety. The function of it is quite simple. In fact, it's, it's kind of um, idiot proof. You simply take your jumper cable leads here and you plug them into the side and the way the plugs are set up they can only go one certain direction. Mm -hmm. 
And instead of having two hot leads now, you actually have an indicator. This LED here on the side will tell you when it's ready. Standby is blue, green is ready to go. So when you hook it up to the battery, that those lights will tell you exactly when you're ready to go. Another feature that it has is this little red button here. If it's if your battery is so dead that it's not even getting an indication, you can push this button and it will create a high output immediate jump start. I want to show you just how easy it is to set this thing up to use. So let's pretend that the Tundra's got a dead battery. Now I just keep this in the toolbox under the back seat of the truck. Handy carrying case that keeps everything together. Take the unit out by the handle. Grab the jumper cable ports. Remove the protective cover. Noticing that the leads can only be plugged in a certain way. There, we got our standby light. You see that light turns green, telling us that it's ready to go. And it's really that simple. Once the vehicle started, simply take the unit back apart and put it away. The system comes with everything you see here and it recharges very quickly via type C input what I like about this is I can plug it into the USB on my truck and charge it while I have it in the vehicle. If I've had to use it or anything, it allows the kind of top of mind awareness to make sure I'm keeping it charged at all times. Or I can just simply take it into the house, put an adapter on, plug it right into my 120 outlet. With the power bank features, of course, you can charge electronic devices. And then even if you have kind of some old school devices like a GPS or anything else that runs off a 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter, You've got that taken care of as well. LED battery indicator along the side here so you know how much juice you got left. Kelly and I like to watch these Overlander channels on YouTube. And we saw one the other day where a couple was out in their beautiful $100,000 plus rig. And they camped out one night in the middle of nowhere and didn't realize they didn't convert their switch over for their back batteries from their front batteries. And the brand new F-250 was dead as a doornail the next morning and they didn't have a kit like this. Fortunately, about six hours later, they were able to flag somebody down on a forestry service road who was able to come give them a jump start. Something this small, this effective, and this easy to use is a no-brainer to have in your kit. So I recommend having one of these in every one of your vehicles and keeping one around the homestead as well. So I'll put a link below in the video description. You can check that out. You can get it on Amazon right now. And I believe they're actually offering a special on this, a discount on the Amazon price, so be sure to check that out. Okay, let's get back to our work. All right, I think we found a spot, and I was gonna to try to stay dry from the knees up, but fuzz knuckles here will not stop shaking off around me, so I'm gonna get drowned before the day's over. But we know, or from experience, that this is a gravel bar. There's an, an outlet of water, a pretty good sized stream that comes out into the main river right here. So that's what Timber's walking on. We're walking on this big gravel deposit so I can feel with my feet there's some really large stones like that which is too big don't want that and then there's more appropriate size stones so this is I might as well come down here and do this a dark this is about the equivalent <laughs> but we'll start and see what we can come up with oh I miss your plan Further out, this is too small to grab us. We've got where the bigger grab us.
Good job. Okay, drop it. Drop it. <laughs> drop it. <laughs> good job. She's a good boy. Okay. Come here. Stay here. Do you need the keys? Yeah. Come. Come around. Boy, go on. All right, you want to go there, Vic? Stay. All right, so we got two full totes of stone here, and that was that was like a feel around situation. <laughs> so it took a lot longer than I expected. I expected we'd be done about an hour, so we're a little over two now. But we got two totes full. I think that'll get us pretty close. And I know you guys have questions, you have concerns about this, but we'll get into it here in a second when we get back to camp and uh, start laying this stuff out. So I'll show you and we'll address the concerns I think you guys are thinking about. All right, Timber, get your toes back. Back up, buddy. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is do a layout. And my lovely bride is the master of Tetris, so that's gonna be her job. She gets to do all the layout. And since you know, I'm trying to estimate how much stone I need when we are gathering stone in the cold river and wasn't quite sure, so what I'm gonna do is just take the measurements of our wall. I've got some blue tape. I'm gonna go out on the porch and transcribe that onto the deck of the porch the, the dimensions here. So as Kelly's putting out, as she's laying out, she's got an idea of, of exactly what, what orientation she needs. In fact, if we do it that way, then as she's mixing and matching, putting things together, size, color, all of those things, then I can just come take those and say, okay, the bottom of your layout, I'm gonna start working my way up on the left side and then I'll work my way up on the right side. That's the plan at least. But <clears throat> I know a lot of you guys are thinking, Two big concerns that, A, these rocks are obviously full of water. You know, even though a rock is a rock, it still is, is porous. It can still take on water. And there's a lot of algae on it. So the water in the rock is not going to be a big deal because we're not going to lay this up and immediately light a fire where it could heat up, expand, and you could have some you know, exploding rocks type of thing. But given the time for these stones to dry out, we'll be fine before we come up and actually light a fire. So I'm not worried about that. The algae, you know, it just looks funky. Uh, it doesn't allow the good color of the stone to come through. And of course, on the back, we're worried about adhesion. We don't want the mortar to stick to the algae and then the rock fall off because it's just a sheet of algae. So we're actually putting the uh, rocks in soapy water and doing some scrubbing there. So as we do the layout, establish what we need before I have Kelly wash two big totes of rocks, we'll uh, do our layout first and then she can come back and wash because... Uh, that will make things easier. But let's get the layout going. There's a mark on that board right there. Yeah. So take it all the way to the edge. And you gotta line up on that edge of the mark. There you go. There you go. All right, seventy three and a half. I didn't obviously place those strategically, I just set them out. So yeah, but if you imagine that that bucket is really heavy because it's full of rocks soaking. But yeah, if you imagine our line to say, what do we do to 
to configure stuff, but that's the kind of gaps I'm thinking we'll have. Okay. So if we, well, that's not going to fit there. That's not going to fit there. Then I need a, you know, I need something that's a little more whatever type of thing, right? Or we say, okay, let's just move all that up because now we want to do that. So just trying to keep from having these huge gaps. If you imagine half inch, yeah. and then you can have these little pockets, but we just don't want to have something that big in it. So in that situation, we'd have to so, rearrange some things to get. And I noticed that these are all varying thicknesses, if mm -hmm. that's okay. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Okay. And what we want to do is kind of establish a... If this is all going to be face-up stuff, then we want, like right here, that face, that should be face-down because that's super flat, whereas okay. that's got a little little gotcha. crevasse in it. Gotcha. So okay. looking at everything, that's why when I was even picking them up out of the river, I was trying to find stuff as flat as possible. Sometimes it wasn't always the case, but so like that one, really that nice. Yeah, really nice flat on that side. Yeah, that's got a decent flat on that side, but a big curve here. This one, we could possibly even take my hammer okay. and take the claw and knock that tab off. So we have the opportunity to do that as well. I don't know how these will fracture because yeah. you know, limestone, I assume most of this limestone, but this is an aggregate of some sort. So that's not limestone. Um, so yeah, we'll just have to see how, how things fracture if we need to fracture them. But, but yeah. Okay. And then of course, just mixing up size. If you know, we don't want to have all the big ones down at the bottom and all the small ones at the top, so you know, mixing them up and, and kind of laying out that variation there. The well, if you pick up ones like this thing's really heavy, let's put it at the bottom, but you're going to have to have some small ones there with it too because you can't just have all the big ones. But then when we get to the layout of the other, and that's what I'm trying to figure out, do I want to lay both of these out, both corners up at the same time because where they butt together it may give me more advantage to strategically do that, but then we have to have another spot to do a layout. Um, do but, we just have two sections? Yeah, okay. but then we've got the big the window right here takes a big chunk out of that section. So anything above that window, it would be ideal to have. You know, it can still be big, but it needs to be light and thin. Like okay. that one actually should be. That's probably needs to go that way because it's flatter on the backside. Mm -hmm. So something like this, lighter and thin, that will stick better um, versus like even something like this that's small and heavy uh, it may not lay in the mortar as well so we'll just have to get strategic there okay. but these are coming clean pretty well um, so all I'm doing all I was doing was just a little kind of a circle scrub and you can see how you can see the algae rolling off of it and splash <laughs> and then I was, like I said I was just rinsing it in here I'll start tearing out the stove and getting that spot ready and get my bag down. Bag dead. I can do this without getting soot all over everything. Crunchy. So I don't want to get a bunch of mortar drippings on my hexi custom poured concrete hearth stone that I made. I'll link to a video up here in the corner if you want to see that awesome build. So I'm going to tape a trash bag down. Now here the trick is I don't want to tape this down so that as I start laying up stone that it's underneath it and I can't get the bag back out but I don't want to leave too much exposed that of course it becomes um, it becomes a mess so I think I'm just going to come in about come out from the wall about an inch inch and a half and then uh, take the bag down there and that should give me enough of a lip I can pull the tape out, but protect the edges. So before we start laying up stone, you may be asking Troy, are you doing a scratch coat or no scratch coat? And to be honest with you, I am not doing one, but I'm not sure that's the right call. Scratch coat normally on a smooth surface, like a concrete wall, that scratch coat 
put it on, let it cure for 24 hours, and then you've got you've got those notches. You know, if you put it on with a notch trowel, you've got those notches for things to lock into. Now I've got Hardybacker board here that already has texture in it, already has small notches. Everything I've read said you don't need to scratch coat when you've got wall board up. Metal lath, we don't need metal lath either. We'd only do that if we were putting that over wall sheathing like you know, plywood or OSB. We'd have our vapor barrier, then our metal lath, and then put our stone on, just like I did our house 24 years ago. So I'm going to go with no scratch coat. A, it's going to save me a day. Uh, but B, I think it's going to work. Okay, since we've got the hardbacker board here, and that's really made for adhesion. So I think that'll work. Now, we are going to keep our stones wet. Even though they've been in the river, there's probably not going to be an issue, but I'll make sure I keep them at least damp. The idea is if you had a super dry stone, you're putting wet mortar on it before it cures. It's sucking all that moisture out of the mortar into the stone, and it can actually weaken the bond there. So a wet stone, more adhesion. It's like surface tension of the water on the stone, in the stone, the surface tension of the water in the mortar helps lock all that together, keeps everything nice and sticky. So I think that's what we're going to do. Kelly's making pretty good progress on our layout. She's also running out of daylight, so we may, we may just get a little bit. I'm going to mix a small batch of mortar first, start there. All right, so one thing I almost forgot is I want kind of like a ledger board here so that it butts right up against the edge of my hardbacker board and makes a, a boundary to say we can't have any stone hanging over this portion. That way when I put up, we'll most likely be putting tongue and groove or shiplap or something like that. So if I have to have butt, things butted up against this 2x4, when everything dries I can take it down in my actual uh, wall sheathing, whatever that's going to be, we'll be able to have a nice um, factory edge there, if you will. Nice straight edge. So that's what I'm going to do. And um, I only had one 2x4 here, so that will allow me to uh, cut it in half, allow me to get to the certain point. Once we get there, then I can obviously move it up to the next spot. Okay, I've got my mortar mixed up, and I think after um, going back and forth, I think Kelly and I decided we're going to do one side layup and then do the other side layup. We may regret that, but I think that's going to allow me to focus on a key area and just see how it goes. All right, so I picked up Kelly's first row in order and in orientation. So that, that, that. Look a dog here. Next morning, and we've gotten, um, you saw the time lapse of what we did last night. We got to almost to the top before we ran out of mud, and it was late. It was in the, well, it was a little after eight, wasn't it? So we weren't going to go any further. We weren't going to mix up any more mud. I forgot to bring gloves yesterday, and both of my thumbs are just absolutely trashed. 
from the sand and of course the Portland. So ran out this morning and bought some gloves. And what I did before brought you guys along this morning was went ahead and framed out the edges. I really liked how this allowed us to get a nice hard edge. When we come back to grout, we'll be able to fill in and get a nice smooth edge here. So as I mentioned earlier, when we do our, our wall sheathing, most likely um, shiplap or some form of board and batten, something there, we'll see. Then I've got a nice hard edge to butt up against. So I thought, well, let's do that all the way around, of course, even around the window. When we frame out the window uh, or trim out the window, we'll have uh, an edge there that's a reference. But then even across the top, you see I put some three-quarter inch white oak in there. Just happened to have that up here at the camp, fortunately. That's why I never throw anything away, right, Kel? Right. And um, so the idea is to tuck that up. So as we're coming in with sealing material, roof or uh, yeah, the ceiling material, most likely some sort of three-quarter inch wood material, then I want to be able to tuck that in behind the stone. I don't want to have all those un you know, undulations of stone surface where I got to bring the um, ceiling material in and then scribe all of that shape. That would be such a pain in the butt to scribe all that. So I thought, well, if I can create a pocket that I can then slide that three quarter inch material in, then that'll look pretty clean uh, and not have to do all that scribe work. I set the screws out far enough that hopefully when we go to grout everything in, then I can still back the screws out and get the wood out of there. If not, then that was a big mistake. Uh, but we'll keep an eye on that as we go along. So got all that framed out. Uh, I think it's time to mix some new mud. Kelly did a great job laying out the stone. I thought she shorted me, but as we started putting it together, it looks like we're going to have her orientation probably is going to be down to just a handful of stones, plus or minus. Uh, so we'll get that done, and then we'll start on this side. Okay, so uh, got everything in place. Super excited about that. Kelly went back, took the, um, I don't know what the heck you call this tool. I've always called it a mortar spoon, but just the uh, kind of the grout, grouting tool here. Knocked all the high spots down, brushed things down. Now we're going to grout in using the same or same type in mortar. We've got two different grout bags. Um, I think I like this one the best. I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've done any mortaring. Or, but just like we're doing decorating a cake, we're going to squeeze out, fill in our voids. I'm going to work my way down both sides and then um, come back with the, uh, the grout spoon again and knock everything down nice and easy. That's why I've, with these gloves, Kelly and I both have gloves with these reinforced rubber fingers. That will help too. We'll be able to fill that in. Again, le leaving all of our trim boards on to help create that, um, that little buffer.
All right, so Kelly's going around. She's just uh, doing some final details on the on the grouting. Just anywhere that we have a little crack or a little undulation, she's uh, taking her reinforced glove and working that in. Looking really good. Coming together, babe? Yes. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. Yes. So I think uh, what we'll do, of course, we're in the process of cleaning up. I've got my tools cleaned up. That's why I'm soaking wet. I've been out in the rain. Clean up the tools. When she's done here, we'll let this dry. Clean up a lot of our drop plastic mortar, but kind of leave leave the plastic down for a bit because we'll come back and broom this maybe in the morning. Just try to get more loose stuff off of it and sweep it up. Probably won't come back to wash the stones clean. You can I'm still not sure exactly how I want to do that. Some people do a little bit of muriatic with a sponge. Some people just a scrub brush and water. But we definitely want to wait for all the mortar to set up. So we don't have, um, we don't just have this milky mortar water that's going over all of our rocks. But really happy with how it turned out. Not only is it, I think, aesthetically pleasing, but it's going to do what we need it to do. It's going to be a good fire shield. Some of that rock is, is pretty thick. And, of course, with the hardbacker board behind it and then the uh, aluminum-faced insulation, all that is helping be a really good fire barrier to keep studs from getting too hot. But we'll show you some, uh, we'll keep showing you some finished product as we get cleaned up and those type of things. So I do want to show you, this is how many stones we had left. I think Kelly counted, there were less than 19. So I'm so glad we didn't have to go back down to the river today to get more stone, because that would have been pretty tough. It has been pounding down the rain today. So not only have we been working in the rain, but I guarantee you the river's even higher than it was yesterday because it rained all night, it rained all day today, and we're high elevation, so that water comes off the mountain pretty fast. So we're really blessed to be getting this rain because we've been in a severe drought, so we're getting uh, the remnants of Hurricane Helene, but the boys let us know we had a huge tree fall on the property and take out the line between the two transformers we have on our property. So we're without power. We're not going home for another day, but the boys, they know how to take care of the situation at home when there's no power. Oh, and we also had one bag of mortar completely untouched. Probably won't take it back. I thought about it, but since it's been out here in the rain, I hate to take it back and somebody end up getting something that's got a little bit of moisture in it, turned it into a brick. All right, so it's the next morning. The rains have passed. Everything has subsided, and our stone stayed stuck to the wall. What do you think about that, Kel? Yes. So, um, got everything all grouted in. Good to go. What I just did before I invited you guys along here, I just took my brush and just brushed it down. And all we're doing is, is just trying to knock some of the nibs off and anything that's, you know, small granular things and kind of just listening to how it hits the plastic once it's diminished to just a little tiny trickle and, you know, you got most of it knocked off. What we're probably going to do, see, we're not going to wipe anything down. Maybe our next trip may come up and test a little bit with just a wet scrubby type thing, abrasive thing here to maybe try to get some of our stone color back, get some of the mortar off of it, or come up with some heavier rubber gloves and do a little bit of a muriatic acid play there. Right now, just very, very happy with how it turned out. Everything's sealed up nicely. You know, what's going to be nice is this is not only a, a fire barrier to keep the studs behind from getting too hot, but some of the, you know, the thickness of the stone and the concrete, as we've discussed already when we did the hearth, hearthstone, was the thermal bank that this will create. So with this little wood stove we have, it works great, but I got to get up in the middle of the night, depending on how cold it is, I got to get up in the middle of the night at least once to stoke the fire. So once we get our walls insulated and have this thermal battery here, may not have to get up at all, just let the fire burn out and the radiant heat from this thermal battery with the insulation in the cabin may keep it toasty even when it's really, really cold outside. But anxious to try that when that comes. So I'm gonna pull up the plastic here and uh, we'll see, uh, we'll, you guys can watch to see, just make sure I didn't mortar all my duct tape down to the, uh, to the concrete.
There we go. It came out of there. I don't think there was an orientation to this. Well, all right. Well, I think that we can call that project well done. Time for us to load up and head back to the farm. We really appreciate everybody watching. Don't forget to check out our new channel, Woodcraft Revival, where we talk about all things wood, wood projects, timber frame, all that type of stuff. I'll link to it here. Pray you all have a great week. Take care.